you, um, Lee, like me to um, start with a prayer at, when you're, whenever you're ready to? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay, okay. Well, um, I'm just glad to see everybody again. And whether you're uh, arriving ne from near or far, um, always happy to have a, a wide circle. So welcome, especially Whitney uh, coming in from Charlotte and others who uh, may not um, be part of the um, usual circle of St. John's folks. We're so uh, glad that you could join Lee and join all of us and be in conversation together. So uh, God be with you. Also with you. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you so many thanks for the day that is now drawing near to a close and for all the blessings that we received. We give thanks that we are able to finish with this time of reflection and listening and conversation with each other. Above all, we give you thanks that you remind us that you are a God who listens, who hears our songs of praise and our prayers and stoops to hear the cries and whispers of those who are needy. We give you thanks for giving us the gift of hearing and of listening, that we may be connected to your world, to your creation, to each other, through this gift that you bestow upon us. Lord, knit us together as your people and Help us always to open our ears, including the ear of our heart, wider and deeper, that we may uh, be more rooted in your love and love for each other. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Laura. And I'm, again, I'm just grateful to be here with y'all again. I just can't get enough of teaching. So... I'm so glad to be here. And I have to say, this is the topic probably of the of all the things we're going to talk about that I could just talk on and off. I could lecture all day <laughs> and all night about this because it's something that I find really fascinating. I also find it very troubling. I feel like it's something that we need to talk about and think about. So I'm really grateful to have this, this part right here in the middle of our time together, this epiphany. Uh, and I want to actually not talk because that's in some ways what's more important to do so what i'm going to do is share screen and let's i want us to give our ears to uh, a woman an african-american woman who is an amazing musician her name is elizabeth cotton and don hart is going to talk about her in a little bit but i figured we would just start by listening to her so let's give her our ears for a moment i'm going to try and share my screen and let's see what we can do so here goes, Elizabeth Cotton.
you're muted. I'm just having a silent musing moment to myself here. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, so Elizabeth Cotton there giving us uh, an example of, we might call it the Piedmont blues. We might call it finger picked guitar, but it's country music. And uh, Pete Seeger recognized that looking on with her. Um, and I think many more of us today are, are wondering, well, okay, if we actually took a longer look, a wider look, I think we might have a broader conception of what country music is. At one point, I remember talking with Reverend Laura uh, early stages here before this program started. And I think we were, we were discussing how country music or bluegrass can often seem like a music that's, that's very white almost as white as your typical uh, Episcopal congregation or some other mainline church congregation. Um, but I think my hope in, in talking about this today is to ask us to think about the ways that music and sound can become coded, uh, you know, C-O-D-E-D. -E it can be aligned with a certain identity. And that's not necessarily one that, that it necessarily has to have or that, that it necessarily has because of history. There are often a lot of other reasons that uh, that music can be put in a category rather than another. So I'm hoping we can reconsider again the context of music making, and that's something that we've been talking about uh, earlier in our discussions of soundscape and so on. Uh, so I mean, this is kind of a rhetorical question: Does it matter the color of a musician's skin? Well, a whole lot seems to be the answer for the vast majority of history. I've been listening while working around the house and getting stuff done, uh, an audiobook version of scholar Ted Joya's book, uh, Music, A Subversive History. It's a little uh, sensationalistic, perhaps. He makes a lot of claims, but one of his continuing arguments through the book, which takes a really expansive look at music history, back to caves and so on, uh, and the, Me the Mesopotamians, uh, he talks a lot about patterns in history, in music history, of a marginalized people, often enslaved people or otherwise really oppressed people, having a musical practice that the people in power like, and then they take it and make it the norm and then reap the benefits of that form of cultural production. And I think we don't have to think too far in our own time to recognize certain examples that have happened, especially between black and white in America. But he, he, he talk, he's talking about the troubadours in the 1200s taking their um, ways of, of singing love songs from enslaved Arabic women. And I mean, he's, he's got a really deep perspective on this particular pattern that seems to happen in human history. So it's not a new thing. It's not something that's uniquely American, but we do have our own way of of participating in this kind of pattern. So it has to do with what uh, the Bob Dylan album title uh, tells us. It's, it's about theft, but also about love and theft. It's about music that moves us. Just like that, I was beginning to tear up a little bit listening to Elizabeth Cotton play. It's, it's, it's very moving music. And I think for someone to wanna to take something, it, it's gotta move them. So there's, there's affinity but also violence involved in these kinds of, of forceful takeovers of culture. So uh, Bob Dylan took that album title from the book, Love and Theft, Black Face Minstrelsy in the American Working Class. It's by a scholar named Eric Lott. And he's one of this of a, a ever growing number of historians and other scholars who are looking back on the history of black face minstrelsy and the minstrel show in American culture. And uh, I will post a link to the film Free Show Tonight that gives a lot more historical context on what this is and, and what it was like. I don't really wanna go into that tonight, but there's a lot of, of context on this history of um, African-American music being, being taken and used by white people. And uh, country music emerged from this, this forceful takeover, this appropriation of black elements and use by, by white people. And it's, uh, you know, if you look at the history of country music, it's, it's, it's just all in there. And um, 
there were examples of on the Grand Ole Opry, which was a very important part of country music in Nashville, um, through and, and touring shows there as part of the people who are the main parts of country music often shared the stage with uh, blackface minstrel performers up through the 1950s. So this is not distant history. So from, for most of a century, this is one of the dominant paradigms for popular culture and entertainment in America and in lots of other places in the world. It's really interesting. I was teaching a history, a bluegrass history course at ETSU and we had a student from Iran and he was talking about some various forms of, of uh, pageants or plays that really were very similar to the, the minstrel show. So it's very interesting. It, it does have a global aspect as well. So anyhow, I, I just want to put that out there and I, I, we can't really go into it a whole lot, but we need to acknowledge th this difficult, uh, violent history of this music. Um, there are a lot of ways to, to do that, however. Uh, we can be accusatory about it, but what good does that do? Um, I think scholars like Alan Farmelow are really helpful in this because they ask us, well, what stories are we telling about the music? Um, there are a lot of stories about country music that, that we see around that really talk about the, um, the importance of various African American or uh, various white or Euro American people who contributed to country music. And they will really emphasize the, the Anglo, the Scots and Irish contributions to country music. But nowhere will there be any mention of the very essential African-American components. And so the stories we tell about the music are really important, right? If we're gonna acknowledge this instrument that I'm pointing to right here, the banjo as an important part of country music. And if we're talking about bluegrass, it's essential then you know, clearly we need to be talking about larger contexts, including Africa and African-Americans. And thankfully, there are a lot of people who are doing really excellent work to help us learn more about this past and to help tell these stories accurately. Uh, there's a book collection that I put on the webpage if you want a link, there's a, a recent book called Banjo Roots and Branches that provides a lot of really up-to-date up -date information about research that's going on, tracing a lot of links between um, things that we that we have known for a while about the banjo here, what was going on in Africa, and things that happened in the Caribbean. So it's a really important resource that helps us be truthful when we're talking about these histories. And I, I mentioned Alan Farmelow. I think he he had a in the early two thousands he wrote an article that's really helpful for challenging us to to think about new stories that we can tell about the music. Um, and Rhiannon Giddens, uh, who've, anyone, raise your hand if you've heard Rhiannon Giddens music. Okay, she's, she's definitely a bit out there in the world. She's an amazing musician, another North Carolinian, gotta love another Tar Heel. And uh, she's been doing amazing work to highlight the role of African-Americans in the past and also to work for to work towards new and interesting music. I think the, the music she's making with her current partner, Francesco Trini, is really interesting and finds a lot of other stories to tell about, about the tambourine. Uh, you know, it's really interesting. I had not really thought about the history of the tambourine, but they're, they're really looking into that and it's fascinating and it's really compelling, beautiful music. So if you haven't checked her out, um, really suggest you, you do so. And she gave a speech as a keynote lecture to the International Bluegrass Music Association a couple years ago. And I put a link to that as well. If you haven't looked at that, I suggest you do. And uh, Marilyn, you're, you're nodding your head. Did you, did y'all look through that? Yeah, I did. Tom had other things going in his life, but I was just amazed at that speech. It was really, really good and, and so deep. And she had evidently done lots of research before she put that speech together. Absolutely, I think that's one of the things I really respect about her. She's a fantastic uh, creative and technical performer and she has done her homework. And I think that's really important. You know, if we're gonna work for change, we need to be informed, absolutely.
And uh, one of the things that she says that really has struck me and sticks with me is that she's, she's asking us to not to put diversity into bluegrass, you know, not to have this be some sort of uh, political correctness thing to say that, that music, uh, country music should be diverse. But she's saying we need to put it back in and just acknowledge that there have been a lot of different people and a lot of different kinds of people from different places who have contributed to, uh, to bluegrass in particular and to country music. So I wanted to, uh, oh, and Amethyst uh, Phillips, Amethyst Kia, if y'all have heard of her, she's a, a graduate from ETSU. Uh, I had the privilege to work with her some as a student and it was great. She, she was with us on a group of, of students that went to the Czech Republic as a study abroad, performance abroad class. And that was just a hoot. The Czech people were just like, whoa. Emily says they, uh, Emily, uh, my wife was with us on the trip and she said that they, they treated her like a goddess. She was just this amazing performer. And also they were surprised. I think folks over there didn't really in 2011 know as much about this, this history of a, a wider, more diverse country music. That is, that story is getting out there more now, 10 years later. She's, she's doing a lot of work here as a local uh, celebrity of sorts to, to get this, this message out as well. But I wanted to switch now to, um, to let someone else tell a little bit more of this story. And uh, y'all, you all might know uh, Don Hart. When we were, when we were meeting together in the nave, uh, he, I, he was sometimes up there, uh, up on the, up on the platform. He's a limb, right? A, a lay Eucharistic minister, and he's he's around the church. Uh, but it's really a shame that his guitar playing is not as present as his Eucharistic ministry. But I, I'm sure he's a really awesome limb. But I, I know that he is a really great guitar player. And I talked to him and he agreed to um, tell y'all a little bit more about the style of guitar that he plays and to talk about this uh, wide range of, of influences that are a part of it. And I don't think, it, Don, are you here with us secretly hiding somewhere? Okay, you're not, he's not sneaking in any, anybody. So not, he's not gonna like photobomb us out of the corner of somebody's frame. Okay, he, he said he would try to join us, but uh, we'll see if he pops in here. But here, I'll let Don give us the next segment. And then I'd definitely like to we'll see if I can come up with some uh, some breakout rooms. Uh, I'm not, we'll have to see if that's possible, but let's let's listen to him. We can talk about responses and then hopefully we can talk more about the songs that, that I asked y'all to be thinking about, the songs and their context. All right, let's see if I can find Don here. Oops, that's not right. Here we go. Hello, I've been asked by uh, Lee to make a few comments on uh, Travis style picking, thumb style picking, uh, finger style picking as referred to the likes of Chet Adkins uh, and some of its origins and uh, the popularity that uh, is associated with it. Uh, well, throughout history and, and through today. I do have some notes to go by just so I try to remain uh, accurate in, my, in what I have to say. Uh, the thumb style uh, picking of guitar originates in the acoustic music of 19th century African American street performers. Uh, people like Arnold Schultz, um, who Another fellow by the name of Mosh Rager out of Kentucky, they were both out of Kentucky, uh, became fascinated with as a teenager and uh, emulated Arnold's style. Therefore, passed it on to the folks, uh, to the likes of Merle Travis, uh, who actually, I think, passed it on to Chet Adkins uh, uh, along that line. Um, Arnold Schultz uh, was born in 1886. He was the son of an African-American slave. Uh, and uh, their family uh, were touring musicians in the uh, Ohio County, Kentucky area. Uh, Schultz began studying the guitar under his uncle, 
uh, back in 1900 or so. And it was under uh, this time spent with his uncle, he began to develop what they call this uh, jazzy style of uh, thumb picking. Uh, and I believe early on was used mostly as a, uh, a rhythm uh, style, a backup style uh, of playing for, for backup and rhythm. This, uh, it, this uh, thumb style then uh, eventually evolved into what they called uh, the Kentucky style, uh, for which, uh, you know, the musicians like Mose Rager, uh, Merle Travis, and Chet Adkins are known for and associated with. Uh, the only other comment I would make is, uh, is that it's said that this com complex uh, cultural history of the evolution of musical styles in rural America music has always been an area of American life where race and ethnicity uh, did not dominate the cultural interactions and musicians of all backgrounds found common ground in their shared love of music. Uh, one of the songs associated with this uh, time period and actually is much older in its origin than, than these fellows uh, is uh, the song, I Am a Pilgrim, uh, it most likely has its roots in African American gospel songs for the period. Uh, Mose Rager said that he got it from his brother, Lyman, who had heard a black prisoner sing it while uh, Lyman was spending time in a, in a Kentucky jail. Uh, this is uh, my version of that. Um, I'm neither uh, a Merle Travis or Chet Adkins style player. I probably uh, fall somewhere in between in my efforts. So here you go. <laughs> associated with uh, Merle Travis is the Nine Pound Hammer, uh, but his version wasn't recorded until 1946, and uh, the first version being recorded in 1927 uh, by Al Hopkins and his uh, Buckle Busters, <laughs> Buckle Busters, um, an interesting group. Uh, they admitted that they had actually pieced the song together from uh, from what each of them could remember. So each of them brought a little bit of the song and uh, they pieced together that version of it uh, back in 1927. The Nine Pound Hammer, uh, of course, was the, the tool of the legendary John Henry, uh, an African-American folk hero who worked uh, as a steel driving man. Uh, Chances are this song was developed uh, by African-American workers who, uh, who worked the steel, uh, who drove the steel rods into the ground and, uh, and helped pave the way of, uh, of the American frontier. So anyway, uh, here's my version of that song. <laughs>
enjoyed these uh, few comments that I've made. Again, uh, I'm not a, a Travis or a Chet Atkins historian. I, I get to hang around with a lot of people uh, who are uh, like Eddie Pennington and uh, these guys out of Kentucky who still carry on the Merle Travis style uh, and do a very good job of it. A lot of um, uh, Chet Atkins style players. Uh, I go to the Chet Atkins convention each year uh, here again, you have a mix of Travis style and uh, Atkins style, and, and uh, nobody seems to care one way or the other. It's just the idea of getting together, sharing the music, sharing the stories. Uh, uh, one other uh, person I'd like to mention in this regard, uh, of course, is Elizabeth Cotton, uh, a black woman who played fingerstyle guitar. Uh, she learned by taking a right-handed guitar and turning it upside down and playing it left-handed. And uh, her style is very, very smooth, very different than Travis. Uh, Travis' style uh, is a very uh, striking style with his thumb taking the lead and then the fingers doing the uh, uh, the melody, uh, whereas Chet Adkins did not have that drive with the thumb. He was more of a, a smooth using both thumb uh, and fingers all together. But anyway, uh, again, uh, maybe this will spark some uh, commentary and interest on your part to go out and uh, do some research on your own. All right, well, thanks, Don. Uh, really appreciate him putting that together for us. I think it um, just recently the IBMA, this Bluegrass Association that I'm that I work with a lot, they established a an Arnold Schultz fund to try and support efforts that would increase uh, the presence of people of color and other people in marginalized areas in the music. And they're they're uh, like they're trying to fund school programs and other ways that uh, the the range of people who are involved in this kind of music is growing. So I think that's, that's it's an exciting exciting thing that can happen when we, when we decide to listen in a broader way and to increase the kinds of stories that we tell about something that's even as limiting, limited or limiting sometimes as country music. But uh, I wanted to uh, ask y'all, uh, let's just let's just stay in the whole group and I would love to hear from y'all if 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 any of y'all uh, thought some on those questions that uh, that I that I borrowed from Jordan Laney, a colleague of mine up at Virginia Tech. Uh, what when when y'all think of of a of a song that you know as a country song um, by a, a narrow or a broad definition, and you think about the context in which it happens. Um, I'm really curious to to hear what you what you came up with. Any anyone want to want to go first? Vol volunteers. Anyone? Here, I'll I'll pull up the questions again that I had. Well, well, fine then. I'll just have to. I'll, I'll have to call out names and, and ask people. Let me pull up the questions again because I think I've forgotten them. All right. Really? Nobody? All right. That's fine. You guys aren't paying that much tuition. Oh yeah, Teresa, go for it. Mute myself. I, I continue to be amazed at the similarities between what we've always thought of different genres of music, but when you hear them to, together or side by side, the similarities there from the bluegrass to the uh, Gullah African music to, to things more modern like Zydeco. I mean, that the, the similarities are there and you, I would have never thought of that because I kind of have learned to like them in their own little containers, but they really cross over. I, and I, I, that impressed me a whole lot. 
Yeah, well, thanks, uh, Teresa. I think that's, it is a really important part. We, we do like to put people, we put, we put things into boxes. You know, I think in some ways that's what stereotyping is about. It makes it simpler for us to deal with them. Absolutely. And it's harder, it's harder to see larger pictures. Um, so the, the questions that I was, that, I, that I've been thinking about really since, since uh, Jordan uh, shared these a while ago with me, when we think about a song, when we think about um, Move Daniel, right? The, from the McIntosh County Shouters, when you think about what did the song do and for whom? Who, do, who does the song pacify and who does it upset? Who's being represented in the music and who's being ignored? Uh, you know, that the song that I put up there, um, Move, Move Daniel, is, is from, I first encountered it through this collection by a gentleman named Jake Blunt. And I, I put a, a link to, to him and use this, this image up there. Uh, so if, if you wanted to explore it further. But he's an Afri he's someone who acknowledges his African American and Native American, I think, his heritage. And he is um, seeking to do something in his music that uh, broadens understandings of what string band music is. Uh, I, if you didn't get a chance to listen to it, uh, let me let me just share a little bit. I'm just going to share the audio if that's okay. So, uh, the, if you want to hear the original the, from the Macintosh County Shouters that that Jake in his liner notes, Jake says he um, he was inspired by, uh, and in this and in his liner notes he says it's from the Macintosh County Shouters, which I think. Uh, um, who was saying someone who was here but is not here today? One of the Mabrys, maybe it was Jackie Mabry, was saying that, that she has connections with Macintosh County there down there on the coast, and she said she was uh, she was excited we were going to talk about this. But uh, in in his words, Jake Blunt says, "Enslaved Gullah Geechee people there on the the Sea Islands in, in Georgia and South Carolina." composed and used this song to covertly guide one of their own named Daniel along a safe route to the master's smokehouse so he could steal meat for their parties. Uh, which is interesting. I did not, I did not know that, that that's something. It reminds me of this kid's book that we have for Willis that's about the, uh, the quilt, the quilts that served as maps to show people the way. Uh, I think it's really interesting to think about these sorts of artistic expressions, having mapping potential or guiding potential. Uh, so this, uh, his version takes what was originally a singing and uh, clapping and percussion, hand and body percussion performance by the Shouters in an early source recording uh, made earlier in the, in the 20th century. And he adds a banjo and fiddle to it to kind of say, hey, we can acknowledge the Gullah Geechee contributions to American culture as a part of what we know of as string band music, something like old time music or country music or bluegrass music. So he, through his artistic productions, like, like uh, Rhiannon Giddens is doing, he's finding ways to fold it all together and, and tell a different story with. It. So let me, let's give a little, I'll see if I can share this with y'all. So let's take a listen here. Okay. Huh. Let's see if I can try it a different way. I don't know why that's not. Let's see. Oh, move Daniel, 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 I'm sorry, y'all. I'm not sure what happened there, why I couldn't hear that. Was it coming through to y'all? 
Oh, that's very strange. I'm not sure what was happening there. I'm going to try that again, and maybe everybody, this will come through. I apologize for that. It's so rocket. I saw your heads bobbing, and I thought something must, good must be happening. Sorry about that. I interrupted you then. Let me try that one more time. Move and you 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 move and stop us again there. It's a five minute track. I could listen to it for more than five minutes. Um, again, there's there's some great percussion there uh, with, I think it's just feet on the, they, they just list banjo and fiddle on the liner notes. So I don't know whose feet it was. Um, but that, it, I think that song really makes me think of the ring shout. Uh, and there's a really interesting history of, of African-American peoples in, in the sea islands. It's such a rich tradition. So I wanted to put down uh, a link to Ranky Tanky, who is another group that's really uh, sh showcasing that, that music and re reviving it, I think, within a context of contemporary jazz, which is, is really great. And they were uh, nominated for an Oscar, but not an Oscar, <laughs> a, 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 um, a Grammy, <laughs> sorry, uh, for their work. Uh, maybe they won, I forget. But they're they're a fabulous group, and they they came and performed as a part of the Mary B. Martin series a while back, and we have been captivated with them ever since. Willis was at the concert and was just tearing it up. It was great. Um, so I I think I encourage y'all to check these out. I think these are more kinds of country music that aren't all by white people, right? And uh, I love this record right here. This is from my grandmother's record collection, which is uh, sort of. Uh, we, we heard about Chet Atkins as a guitar player. He was also one of the architects of the Nashville sound, which was the defining paradigm of country music there as it got polished up in the 1950s and 60s. And I think Ray Charles's work uh, in, in country music is some of the most refined and, and uh, really the, the most Nashville soundy of the Nashville sound. So if you, if you haven't heard these recordings, I really encourage you to. It's good stuff. I played one of the recordings, uh, his version of Blue Moon of Kentucky, which is a Bill Monroe song often played in bluegrass style to my students this morning. And they were a little, they weren't sure what to think about that, but it's, it's awesome stuff. So that, that's kind of a, that's a quick look at some of these issues. But um, uh, one thing that I've been thinking about recently is the idea of land declarations. Uh, has anyone heard that or encountered that in uh, institutional contexts or gatherings? You raise a hand if you've encountered a land declaration, a Native American uh, land acknowledgement. So I encountered it first. Yeah, I, Barbara, did you encounter it in Canada by any chance? Could you, could you tell me again what it is? Um, I think I have, but I'm not sure. 
Well, I first encountered it out west at an academic conference. I think it was a folklore conference. And, and then uh, th at the beginning of the event, some folks said, we want to acknowledge that we are holding this meeting, that we're all meeting here on land that was dwelled upon by people of, of various people groups. And they named the Native American. Where groups. I actually encountered that first was in my storytelling class at ETSU last mm. semester. Mm -hmm. And we listened to some stories by Native American storytellers. And that was said at the beginning of some of those, some of those uh, events. So mm -hmm. I had never heard of that before. Yeah. And I, it was kind of transformative for me, especially as a musician, because it made me think, how could I more effectively give that kind of acknowledgement uh, to declare where I'm coming from and, and who whose shoulders I'm standing on in doing what I do. I think that's really important as a scholar. We do footnotes and everything. And I think there's a lot of ways that we could be more forthright, especially as institutions and in acknowledging the the people whose whose labor and whose ideas have have made made it possible for us to do what we do. I actually so, heard it today. Um, I was in really? the, I attended the Forma conference. Um, and uh, the lady who presented for um, finding God in nature basically declared like that they, you know, and I don't know what the native culture that we're in the upper peninsula that she is, but she declared this is the land that we're on. And we kind of talked about that as well. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Absolutely. Lee, I, I've encountered that um, in Australia. And they always um, these days are acknowledging who has lived on this land before, whose land they are actually on. Um, but, but there's an NPR program. Well, it's one of the local ones that NPR, that WETS puts on. And I'm, it's, it's out of Charlottesville, Virginia. And they always acknowledge the Monacan Nation that, that first held that land. But I wanted to say as far as acknowledging um, musical heritage, we have a deep musical heritage. It's not country music, but in um, classical music in my studio. And we can trace it um, quite clearly. I develop a family tree of the heritage of this is your I'm your teacher, but this is your grand teacher, and this is your great grand teacher, and this, is, and we trace that lineage, and it's it's really an important thing for the students to know. Why do we play this way? And where did it come from? And why is that important? So I know what you're talking about in in honoring the heritage, but it it's so interesting for them to understand why we produce tone in a certain way, but maybe flutists with a heritage from somewhere else do it differently. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I think it's, this is still something I'm wrestling with how to do this well. I think it's hard for us to, to, to look back and really think about, especially the harder parts of history, right? A blackface minstrelsy is really difficult to talk about. It's something that was horribly racist and it was a part of a system of oppression. Uh, but I think if we find ways to, to talk about it and are able to, I think the, the world will change. So th this is a question I have, you know, how, how can we do this as Episcopalians? Is, are there parts of our history that we should acknowledge more? And what are the ways that we could acknowledge and acknowledge them in graceful and loving ways that are, that are real? So that's, that's my parts today. Anyone, anyone else have any thoughts? Uh, Y'all have had some great, some great thoughts today. I'll just say that I, I mean, I am um, in the last couple of years have been very, become very entranced and fascinated and kind of dedicated in my studies, but also in general in exactly what you're talking about in acknowledging and uh, learning about the shoulders that we all stand on. And certainly in the church, we talk about tradition. And that's just another form of 
standing on the shoulders of teachers and uh, spiritual greats. And, you know, one thing that one discovers is that some things that we may think of as sort of more newfangled theology or radical modern uh, theology or positions you go down into our spiritual heritage and there it is in the fourth century um, and, and so forth. Um, you know, uh, speaking of God as mother, you know, that's one little example, but it's, it's uh, there's just such uh, riches uh, within our spiritual tradition and it's good to know where, where, that, where that comes from. Um, and it's such a, um, I don't know, just in general, I mean, musically or theologically or otherwise, it's such a, a profound uh, feeling to know that we are connected to the history of humanity in, in the way we pick a guitar or, or embody certain things or, or profess our beliefs or whatever. I, I just find it enormously powerful yeah. work songs i had the honor of hearing a work song that the men of the louisville nashville railroad the railroad was doing away with section crews these were the men who set the rails and did all kinds of different things because they were bringing in an automatic rail setter so they ran the automatic rail setter and the train, which ran right through our farm, made all kinds of rackets and you weren't sure whether it was gonna come off of the track or stay on the track. Not long after that, about four or five days, here came the section crew working, all African-American men with, a, with a, an African-American foreman. He sang and they would hum and then he would say a, a certain word, which I couldn't, understand because I was on my horse and I was about 50 or 60 yards back from where they were working and they would lift those set those rails up with crowbars and then they would reset the rails and you'd hear the fellows with the sledgehammers in time in rhythm with this man singing driving those spikes setting those rails it was I often wished I'd had a recorder but I sat there for probably 20 minutes entranced just listening to those men sing and work and every time they did they lifted the rails then they drove the spikes and it was all in that song when to do what and when there's there's a, ma a, a, a magic in that music absolutely um and that there's that's that's one of the things that that i've been gushing about to the grad students the Gandhi dancers, that was one name for those folks and what they were doing, the lining crews. Uh, and that's, you know, that that labor is something that happened. Thomas Burton documented Gandhi dancers working on the Clinchfield Railroad in the 1970s, I guess, is when he was filming them here in our area. And, and they're singing as well as the labor and also this tension between old and new that was happening around that time here. Uh, but that the labor of those section crews and the music that kept them all together kept trains on the tracks. The history of country music is full of these disaster ballads, the wreck of the old 97, the trains that leaped the, leaped the, the tracks and crashed. And it was the work of those folks that kept the rails right on so that the trains wouldn't fall off on the curve. And it's so amazing to think that music was a big part of making that happen. That's a the beautiful and really great point, Tom. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. Well, Laura, I think you'd better you'd better take over because <laughs> I think it's time. I think I won't take over, but I will offer a time of prayer. <laughs> um, Nick, could you uh, screen share? I would like to before we do that. I would like to. This is Ginger, and I'd like to have a little bit of, of information to go out. This area is so rich with the Native American, uh, this, this pathway between north, south, east, and west. And there were trails and there were travels 
and the Native American came up as far as the Seminoles out of Florida. Uh, there's a phrase that I've heard in this area many, many times, and, and people don't know what it means. And the phrase is, the good Lord will, and its creeks don't rise. And over the years, people have thought that the creeks meant uh, creeks where water flows, but that's not true. It actually has to do with the Creek Indians. And that is um, over on the Virginia side and in um, Pennington Gap and oh, going over the Cumberland Mountains, uh, there was Fort Blackmore in Virginia. And if there was a rising, as the word is called, because the migration patterns were going west. And so the men would, would they, they got all the families and everybody up to Fort Blackmore. And then the men would have to leave after a few days to go back and tend to the animals. And the phrase became, I'll return the good Lord will and if the creeks don't rise. So when you hear that, it's almost um, the, the true meaning has been lost over time. So when you hear that remind people that that is a uh in the 17 late 1700s as they came down and lee i would also like to call your attention and then i'll quit talking to an instrument uh from west africa it's called the cora k-o-r-a and you can do a search engine just by putting in a cora instrument and you will see an instrument that is related to the harp it has 21 strings and it's made out of a huge gourd. And the music is just numinous would be the word that I would that I would call it. So, you know, give respect to the Native American. I mean, this this is just travel up and down, north and south and east and west, you know, and if you've ever been to a powwow, um, it's a it's a just a different kind of experience. And a lot of people in this area have um, Native American ancestries. So um, those are my points. Thank you. Thank you, Ginger. That was fabulous. Thanks for chiming in. Hmm. Whew. Thank you, Lee. And um, I think now maybe uh, Nick, can you uh, pull up our um, Compline service for screen sharing? Thank you. And perhaps not in the same way, I'll just say um, one other word, maybe not connected historically in terms of standing on shoulders, but um, this, uh, like all of our, our round of daily and evening prayers, this is, a, these prayers are being said now by many, many communities and people around the world. So we are, uh, connected in prayer uh, by a common prayer, which is a lovely thing to remember as we begin. The Lord Almighty grant us a peaceful night and a perfect end. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Let us confess our sins to God. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you through our own fault in thought and word and deed and in what we have left undone. For the sake of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, forgive us all our offenses and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. May the Almighty God grant us forgiveness of all our sins and the grace and comfort 
of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh God, make speed to save us. O oh Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Let us say together Psalm 31. In you, O Lord, have I taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Incline your ear to me. Make haste to deliver me. Be my strong rock, a castle to keep me safe. For you are my crag and my stronghold. For the sake of your name, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net that they have secretly set for me, for you are my tower of strength. Into your hands I commend my spirit, for you have redeemed me, O Lord, O God of truth. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Thanks be to God. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. For you have redeemed me, O Lord, O God of truth. Keep us, O Lord, as the apple of your eye. Hide us under the shadow of your wings. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. Lord, hear our prayer and let our cry come to you. Let us pray. Be present, O oh merciful God, and protect us through the hours of this night, so that we who are wearied by the changes and chances of this life may rest in your eternal changelessness through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Keep watch, dear Lord, with those who work or watch or weep this night and give your angels charge over those who sleep. Tend the sick, Lord Christ. Give rest to the weary Bless the dying, soothe the suffering, pity the afflicted, shield the joyous, and all for your love's sake. Amen. O oh God, your unfailing providence sustains the world we live in and the life we live. Watch over those both night and day who work while others sleep, and grant that we may never forget that our common life depends upon each other's toil through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And I invite you to offer your 
prayers of intercession and thanksgiving at this time. And you may unmute yourself to offer your prayers aloud if you wish. Give thanks for all those on whose shoulders we stand, known and unknown. Give thanks for Lee and all gathered here. Pray for safety for all on this night and all who may be stranded out in the cold without shelter. Give thanks for the gift of community. Guide us waking, O Lord, and guard us sleeping, that awake we may watch with Christ and asleep we may rest in peace. Lord, you now have set your servant free to go in peace as you have promised. For these eyes of mine have seen the Savior whom you have prepared for all the world to see, a light to enlighten the nations and the glory of your people, Israel. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Together, guide us waking, O Lord, and guard us sleeping, that awake we may watch with Christ and asleep we may rest in peace. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Almighty and merciful Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us. Amen. <laughs>